What is home? I grew up in New Hampshire in an old colonial house built in the late 1800s. My parents still live there. They are getting older and the house requires a lot of work and upkeep. Every hard winter we have, my parents talk about selling, but we don't really have the heart to put the for sale sign out. It's our family home. For me, it's the place of countless birthdays, sleepovers, and family memories. The idea of selling that house breaks my heart. The definition of home might vary from person to person, but it has a universal importance and sentiment far beyond land and property value. This is The Pursuit, a podcast about government action and individual liberty. I'm Tess Terrible. In this season of The Pursuit, we are exploring property rights and government action. We're going to start with eminent domain. This is Trevor Burris, research fellow here at the Cato Institute's Robert A. Levy Center for Constitutional Studies and co-host of Free Thoughts Podcast. For some people, they think that eminent domain is is an essential government power. And and here's this kind of situation where they would think it's essential. There's a road that's being built and a bunch of houses are going to be bought by the government and they just buy it to build the road and the road is going to benefit the public in some way. There's a bunch of stuff in the Fifth Amendment due process clause and the right against self-incrimination. But one of the things at the end of the Fifth Amendment is a clause that says, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. This is the takings clause. It says the private property is being taken and it has to be be taken for public use. And if they take it for public use, they have to provide the owner with just compensation. When this occurs is when, for example, they want to build a park or a road or an airport or other things that the government generally says that's good for the public. In most cases, eminent domain is used to take physical property. Government then pays the owner just compensation or fair market value. Government can't force an owner to sell their property for less than a fair price, a price they wouldn't take from a private buyer. Public use requires government to use the property for a public benefit, a public road, an airport, etc. In a domain, they talk about things that, that, such as roads and schools and public parks and things that generally people can accept as a public use. But when we start talking about things that benefit the public, uh, that becomes a very, very kind of expansively possible definition of public use. The most famous example of this is in the Kelo case, wherein the argument was was that taking this woman's house in order to do a development with businesses, including Pfizer, and hopefully restaurants and stores and things like that, would raise the tax base and raise more money for the town of New London, Connecticut. And that itself was a public use. Getting more money from tax revenue was a public use. The case Trevor mentions here is the infamous Kilo versus New London case decided in 2005. We'll learn more about that case later. For now, I'd like to introduce a case that illustrates how eminent domain is affecting us today. The town of Brookline, Massachusetts is situated directly outside of Boston. 14% of Brookline residents hold a doctorate degree the largest percentage of any town in the United States. Higher education is one of the biggest industries in the Boston area. The Boston area is the home of big name universities such as MIT and Harvard University. But it also includes small colleges like Pine Manor College. Pine Manor College is a place that is small in size. We often joke, the great thing about Pine Manor College is that everybody knows your name. The bad thing about Pine Manor College is that Everybody knows your name. This is Tom O'Reilly. He's the president of Pine Manor College. In fall 2017, he received some news concerning Pine Manor College and the Brookline Public School District. Tuesday morning after Labor Day, my office got a call for an emergency meeting with the town administrator and the chair of the board of select men to meet with them. And of course, I made room on my calendar given it was called an emergency. And they came in and said, we're going to be meeting an executive closed session today. And that during that time, 
we will be discussing legal strategies. And my question to them was, well, what's that got to do with the college or me? And they said, well, one of the legal strategies we're going to discuss is whether or not to take, include Pine Manor College in the consideration for taking the land for eminent domain purposes in order to build a school. And I was shocked. I said, wait a minute, there must be a process. How does this work? Tell me the rest of the story here. And they said, well, it's just going to be a strategy discussion. We will give you a heads up if we're going to do anything further. Two weeks later, on a Tuesday afternoon around 3 o'clock, I get a phone call from the town administrator saying, as promised, I wanted to give you a head up, heads up. We're going to recommend that Pine Manor College be looked at as a location for eminent domain action in order for the town to build a school. Tom told me the school is not looking to sell any portion of their campus, but Pine Manor could be forced to. The town could use eminent domain to force the small private college to sell. The town of Brookline is proposing to take seven acres of land from Pine Manor College, a private four-year liberal arts college, in order to build a public school. The town has limitations or feels as though their enrollment needs are driving their need to build an additional school. And they believe that they would like, that they would be best suited if it's located on Pine Manor College's property. The town is proposing to take the front gate of the college, uh, the front gateway of the college, which is about seven acres, seven to eight acres. It is relatively flat land. It is where today we have many of our sports practice areas. We have a softball diamond. We have a pond. That area is used as the traditional venue for our graduation sites. It is used as the practice sites for our nearly 40% student population that are student athletes. It is an area that has mature trees. It is property that was prepared and the plantings were cited uh, by James Arnold, who is the, the Arnold Arboretum fame, and which is one of the most distinguished parklands in Boston. It is a unique feature to the college. It represents about uh, a little more than 50% of our open space. We believe that it's very important to the visual beauty of and importance of the campus. Pine Manor College is indeed a really small college. It's certainly not as well known as some of the bigger colleges in this area. This is Jonathan. He's a student at Pine Manor College. So a little bit of background about me is, like I said, I'm from Oakland, California. There's only three options, um, honestly, when you're back in Oakland. It's either you do the right things, um, you hang around the wrong people, you're in jail, or you or you're dead. For those things, uh, I went to a small private um, high school, very small um, Christian school, where my brother and I both went. It was small. It was some things that I wish I could change, but it was the best for me. And yeah, it, it made me kind of who I am today to get to kind of where I'm at now. Like a lot of students at Pine Manor, Jonathan is worried about this case. I don't think it's a good idea at all. The reasons why I, I can say is First of all, it's so busy now. <laughs> Having another school with kids and all that stuff, that would just be horrendous. Um, and second off, it's a college campus. Um, we want to be able to enjoy our experience with people that are our age, not little kids walking by. And no offense, I mean, we're, I mean, whoever's been to college would know that they had the time of their lives. They did crazy things. And you don't want kids to see that, you know. And I don't think parents would want to see their kids like, Mommy, I just saw somebody just do this, or they said this. And those things right there, I feel, are not things that should be on this campus. First of all, it's a shame that what the town has done in this case, uh, the town officials have done, is they've pitted two very important educational missions against each other. It's the only situation of the possibilities they have in front of them that does that. So first and foremost, what they've done is pit two important educational missions against each other. Secondly, by proposing Pine Manor College, they've proposed the only proposal that puts at risk an educational institution. And third, it's the only proposal that would use up seven acres of open space. How are your students holding up? Well, you know, it's interesting. People ask that question a lot. And I think what's important to know about the students at Pine Manor College in selecting Pine Manor College, they had choice, and they've had a lot of obstacles thrown in front of them. Most of our students are working about 30 hours a week to help pay for their college. 
They're borrowing money to pay for college. They've got their heads down and they're working hard. So I would say our students are taking it well. I'd say they're taking it well because it feels like one more roadblock that somebody's throwing in front of them. I'd say they're doing well because when we brought them here, we brought them here because they had that grit and resiliency to get through things. But I don't think they should have to be just doing well. I don't think they should have to have this burden thrown at them. They didn't do anything to cause this burden to exist. You know, people financially wise, they were saying that our school is going to close down. There was a lot of things going around on the news. Uh, people, kids, we even got the message, uh, like screenshots, people were sending it around. And I think for that, it was kind of a worry for me. I was like, oh man, like my school might be closing down. I, I put so much to come here. But at the end of the day, I think this school right here is just continuing to show that we continue to fight no matter what. Um, we're not just going to lay down low uh, no matter what. Um, as students, as faculty, anybody was able to step on this campus just for one moment um, and have a day in a life with a, with a Pine Manor student or a faculty, they would see how unique it is and why, why we are Pine Manor College and why we're so amazing. Today, we are a college that serves 85% students of color. We are co-educational. 84% of our students are first in their families to attend college. 80% are low income. 50% are multilingual. Most of our students are coming from communities that are densely packed. They come from predominantly inner city environments. They come to places where they don't have the open landscape that we have here. That's one of the things that gives them vision, hope, aspirations. It reinforces what they want and it shows them that they're on the track to get there. I think it's narrow to think of it as just land and asset dollars on value. But we want to think about it in terms of values and what it means. It's like the town meeting member who came in to me and said, are we talking $27 million or what? And my response to him was, you see, that's the problem. You're talking dollars and I'm talking values. You're talking about real estate and I'm talking about what matters. What the town is saying to me, it's just land. And what I'm saying to the town is, it's not just land, it's part of the whole. And so I believe that it's too great to risk the outcomes that this college is having, success rate with graduation, population we're serving, and the career and graduate school opportunities they get when they finish, to just say, it'll be okay. My view is that it's important for me to protect what's working here to enhance what's working here and to make sure people know what's working here because the population we're serving is too important to be left behind and to be left at risk. This is eminent domain, government power to take private property for public use, government taking land from a private school to give to the public school district. There is no way that Pine Manor would sell willingly. Tom O'Reilly explained to me, there is no just compensation here. There is no fair market price. It would be a bigger loss to the campus than a financial gain. They view that land as vital to the campus. We'll come back to Pine Manor College. For now, I'd like to provide more background on eminent domain. To do so, we need to go back to 2005 to the Supreme Court case Kelo versus New London. This is Scott Bullock, President and General Counsel at the Institute for Justice. And this is Dana Berliner, who is the Senior Vice President at the Institute for Justice. They argued the historic Kelo versus New London case. Eminent domain is the power of government to take someone's property away from them. And there are two requirements for government to exercise eminent domain. It has to be for a public use and it has to be justly compensated. 
Well, the Kilo case started in uh, the late 1990s in a working class neighborhood in New London, Connecticut called the Fort Trumbull neighborhood. It had been there since the 1800s. It was at one time largely an Italian neighborhood that had then diversified over, over the years. It was a neighborhood where people had lived oftentimes for generations. It was a very close-knit community. It was an area that was really working class. It was next to a uh, sewage treatment plant. It decreased the desirability of it in, in, in some ways, but people still loved being there. It also happened to be near the water as well. As Suzette Kilo said when she first looked at this little cottage that she then painted pink and made her own, she said, I can afford this house with this view on a nurse's salary. The neighborhood of Fort Trumbull consisted of about 20 single and multifamily homes built in the early 20th century. The town planned to seize these homes using eminent domain and demolish them as a plan for private economic development in New London to support a new headquarters for the pharmaceutical company Pfizer, a private corporation. The town argued that the possibility of economic development more jobs and more taxes, was enough to call it public use. Part of the arrangement that was made but for Pfizer to come there was that the Fort Trumbull neighborhood would be acquired to do private development projects to support the new Pfizer facility. So that led to the confrontation where they, the city and a private party, the New London Development Corporation, decided that they were going to take the Fort Trumbull neighborhood to give to private parties. Some people decided that they wanted to sell. Some people sold reluctantly under the threat of eminent domain. And a group of seven property owners decided to fight back and challenge this abuse of eminent domain. The lead client that I mentioned, Suzette Kilo, was a nurse. She left a bad marriage after raising five sons. And it was really starting a new chapter in her life. She had just turned 40. She went to school to become an EMT and then eventually a nurse. She struck out on her own and she found this little house, this little cottage from the 1890s, I believe it uh, was, that was right by the water. It was not in very good shape, but she bought it, poured her heart and soul into it, painted it pink, or, or Dessa Rose, as she, uh, as she calls it, her favorite color. And it was the first piece of property that she had ever owned in her entire life. And so that's why it was so important to her. And only about a year after she had lived there, she got the knock on the door saying that the New London Development Corporation was interested in buying her property. The rest of the property owners were, some had families, some had been in the neighborhood for decades. Another fellow owned apartment buildings and a delicatessen. Uh, he lived on the properties for years. So these were working class folks. Most of them had blue collar uh, type of jobs or service sector jobs uh, like Suzette. And these homes meant everything to them. They wanted to be there. The Cristofaro family but had some old roots in the neighborhood uh, from the uh, when it was largely an Italian uh, neighborhood. And they not only wanted to keep their homes, but it was a true close-knit community where people knew one another, cared about one another, and wanted to stay there. They wanted to remain in New London. The plaintiffs didn't want to sell. But most importantly, the plaintiffs believed that what the town was doing was wrong. This is Mike Cristofaro, whose parents owned a home in the Fort Trumbull area. We met in his home just outside of New London, Connecticut. A fair warning, this is right before the holidays and the Christopharos had just adopted a new puppy. You might hear him in the background. Everybody in the neighborhood, when the news came that, you know, the area was gonna change, you know, that there was gonna be some development. And we were like, yes, it's a long time coming. You know, you know we wanna be part of this. You know, because the property wasn't needed. It, 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 what was happening was Pfizer's was coming in. It was a whole different section of the fort that wasn't, you know, it, it was an old factory that was being torn down that, that was cleared of um, contamination and stuff. So it was like, great, you know, we're here. We're going to be part of the um, development. But then we come to find out it was, no, 
we don't want you in the neighborhood. We, we want your house. We want your property. And then it was like, no, you can't do this. This is wrong. You can't, you can't, can't just take someone's home and give it to somebody else just so they could say, we're going to build a hotel on it. That's wrong. You know, my parents, they came over from Italy in 1962. They wanted to pursue that American dream. They wanted to make something better for their family. And um, you know, they came and they actually, New London was their first stop. And, um, you know, my father worked, you know, 80, 90 hours a week. Uh, he, he was renting an apartment. He had, well, there was four of us. I was just born. Uh, they came over in October and I was born in December. So, you know, they had a, a newborn plus, you know, three other kids. After about six, eight months of living here, they just found that, you know, having an apartment with someone telling them what to do and, and you know, when to do it, you know, flushing the toilet, that type of thing back then, he decided to buy his first home. It was home to our family. It was, you know, my brothers had their families there. They, they raised their kids. Everyone kind of knew each other. You know, it, it, it was a really nice neighborhood. You know, uh, they wanted to paint it as a bad neighborhood, you know, but there was no crime. There was nothing. My niece, she was five, no, I think four. This is how safe the area was. I mean, she, she, would, she left the house and my brother and sister-in-law didn't know that she left, went to the house next door, climbed up the stairs and walked into the house and, you know, the family that was there, you know, there were two wonderful sisters uh, called next door and says, oh, don't worry about your uh, child. You know, Amy's over here and uh, she's having a bowl of soup. As Michael describes here, his family has a tremendous connection to their family home and to New London, Connecticut. He was born in New London shortly after his parents immigrated from Italy. Michael comes from a humble family of humble means, and their neighborhood in New London, Connecticut, is the only home they ever knew. Their home meant everything to them, as home does to so many people. It is the reason so many people connected to this case. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. It seemed to be a clear-cut case the plaintiffs did not want to give up their homes for any price, and their homes would not be taken for public use. They'd be given to powerful corporations. That's why it was so shocking to hear. We lost by one vote. We will continue these stories next time on The Pursuit, and we will hear from the one and only Suzette Kilo. The Pursuit is produced and hosted by me, Tess Terrible. It is a project of the Cato Institute and Libertarianism.org. 